You know, if we do this long enough, you might be able to make a super cut of all the times that I dance in my seat just doing this. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. How you doing, everybody? We How missed you. you. Doing? It's been two weeks. It has. It has definitely not been like five minutes. It's probably closer to ten. Depends on how long the, the audio version takes to export. Behind the scenes camera magic go! I should have made like a music effect there, like but I it, it just slipped my mind. You, anyway. You could probably throw it in because the, the thing I'm more <laughs> concerned about right now is anybody listening on audio is just like, what the hell just happened? It went quiet. <laughs> I heard I heard rushing noise. This is our podcast about digressions. This yeah. is actually not our podcast about digressions, but we will have one. This is about the maladaptive modern life. I like my alliterations. Yeah, the, the, you, you suggested this topic, and it was a really good one. Yeah, the sort of the things you do that feel good, but are actually bad for you. Yeah, and there's like a lot that. of them in, in modern life. Like, I'm not just talking about like you know smoking cigarettes or whatever. I'm talking about there are things out there that we prize and cherish and whatnot, but sometimes when you think about it, it doesn't take very much for those things to all of a sudden consume a lot of your time. And we'll talk about a couple of those. because it's good, because I'm really curious, because I don't know what those things are. Uh, well, I, I know that you've already put a rule in your life to help you avoid one of those. Point. Yeah, so. that's true. Um, but Icebreaker. Speaking of... of consequences and time and the wasting thereof if you had a pile of consequence free time that you were not like like you could only waste how would you waste it uh so i know i gave one answer when we developed the show notes and, and you have two answers because you always I, have two I answers. I have two answers because I also thought of a second thing. Uh, <laughs> so the first answer that I gave is I would probably play a lot more video games. Mm. Um, that tends to be something that I'll squeeze in here and there. And luckily, I'm um, I'm like one of those sprinter um, video game players where I play in very intense short bursts. Uh, but then, for whatever reason, I quit for... Because I'm like I get bored with something, or it's too challenging at the moment, so I want to take a break to refresh, uh, or because I start to feel guilty about not doing properly constructive things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how my video gaming habit would change if I had a truly consequence free time, but uh, so I would probably guilt free play some video games. Nice, um, nice. But the second thing I would do is I would probably focus on like a maker project um uh, so, uh, that doesn't sound like wasting that sounds like doing stuff well kind of it depends on what mm. i uh, but it kind of depends on what i'm doing with it like for example last year i bought are you that, learning things well i'd have to i'd have to because last year i bought that beginner's like introduction introduction to electronics kit mm -hmm. and it's been just sitting there not doing anything and a mm -hmm. lot of times when i sit down to learn to do stuff I guess it just it all depends on what you mean by consequence free. Like, it, does it have to be something that is completely inane, like watching paint dry, or does it have to be something that is only just taking away from the other things you should be doing? Because that's what this would do. This would take a lot of the time that I should be focusing on my volunteer work or work work or uh, personal like personal care stuff like fitness or doing dishes or something like this this would this would be so, productive given that it builds skills yeah as opposed to say video games which don't build skills in the same sort of direct way okay um that does not seem like wasting time okay in that case i revise and only have one answer I'd probably play more video games. I think this is the first time we've ever, like, vetoed an answer on the uh, icebreaker. It's probably just because you're secretly tired of all my two answers, and you're like, no, no, absolutely not. You were going to have Listen, one answer to this time. we had a pre-show, and you said what your answer was in the pre-show, and we're going to stick to that plan. You know, if we started filming our pre-show, at least I'd have to stick with those, con like, yeah. stick to that commitment. Because that would work. Yeah, I know. There'd be so many bad things. <laughs> Uh, for me, uh, I, I don't have the same problem with video games. I will happily play 18 to 20 to 25 to a million hours of video games um, to the point where I 
have a sort of semi-purposefully uncomfortable chair. Like, I can't really sit in it for longer than about ten hours, Mm -hmm. six hours, without getting uncomfortable, so I have to get up and move around. Um, No, I would watch all the anime. (laughs) All of it. I would watch every little bit of it. I have sort of very strict rules about media consumption, and we'll talk about those when we get into the actual topic, but... Uh, even then, usually if I'm if I'm watching media, I'm also doing something else. I'm playing video games, or I'm writing, or I'm working on website stuff. Or, mm-hmm. You know, I'm doing I'm editing videos or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm doing something else. It does not have a hundred percent of my attention. And with anime, especially I mean with subtitled anime, you need it to have a hundred percent of your attention because I don't speak Japanese and I won't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. So. I don't really watch TV, but I double don't watch anime, Mm -hmm. which sucks because there's lots of really cool anime, but anytime I'm like, oh, I could watch some anime, I'm like, A, Jim, you have rules, and I'm like, B, all I'm going to be doing is watching that. I I could totally do something else and watch something else and just just do that, so I do that instead. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so I never, I haven't watched anime in years, but I really like it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I listen to a couple of anime podcasts and things like that. And I hear about it, but I don't really watch it. I'm like a fake anime nerd. <laughs> Such a fake anime nerd. It's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we, we identified some patterns in yeah. the ways that we sort of waste time and the ways that we, we, not just waste time, but har- harmfully engage in self-care. Mm-hmm. Like, the notion is that this is a thing that you do because you're like, you know, I'm I'm going to feel better, and I just need to get through a bit of this. Mm-hmm. And it winds up being a thing where you're like, I feel actually bad afterward. Mm-hmm. And that was consumption and creation. And yeah. Consumption, you got into things like binge watching yeah so i mean with the with the advent of technology we've eliminated some barriers to to content that we didn't have before um so the concept of binge watching is is fairly new i mean not it depends on Mm. how how you define it last like 10 years yeah it, it depends on how you define it and how and how i mean like you could say uh, maybe not binge watching, but like I could see somebody binge reading, um, or you know, you could maybe binge through movies or something like that. Mm-hmm. But in terms of like television, television was always delivered in a particular way. It was usually just you know one episode at a time in Western, like North American television. By North America, I mean usually U.S. Um, you know, you have. 21 to 24 episodes per season that's usually spread out over what like 40 weeks give or take mm-hmm. it's not 100 it's not a full year but there's a break at christmas and there's usually some sort of um summer break before they start releasing new episodes middle late fall <clears throat> but it was always controlled and unless i guess the closest you've ever come to like netflix binging would be when the law Law and Order was in, hit syndication, and they just played it all day. Yeah, like they run marathons. Over yeah, there. or CSI or anything like that. So with Netflix, suddenly you you open up to this new possibility of being able to watch content all the time, and usually you'll find something and it'll, you'll be really interested in it, and you'll just watch content. Well, on Netflix drops seasons. Like it doesn't drop shows. Yeah. It, just, it goes, oh, okay. Like it facilitates this. Yeah. Netflix shows don't come out in, in you know, a show every week. They yeah. say, okay, we are done. Here is a season of television. Yeah. Do yeah. what you will. Yeah. So season four of Arrested Development, season one of Daredevil, like any of these original contents. Yeah, it's not released time blocked. It is, boom. Here's all at once. Do with it as you will. Yeah. And so, I mean, like, on one level, it seems amazing. Like, suddenly now you have essentially unrestricted access to content, and you can watch it all at once. Uh, It makes for unique viewing opportunities that before you'd have to watch it slowly over 40 weeks. 
um, or you know, you, it was always at the discretion of how it was distributed. Now you can watch the entire season in like a day, day and a half if you take some breaks, and you can spot patterns and you can see characters develop much quicker. It also does have the flip side. I find that character development is f- too quick now with when I watch it all in one go as a, it, where a character might take six weeks to develop something. I watch it over <laughs> the course of six hours. Right. But here's where the maladaptive part comes in is we call it binge watching and evoke this kind of, um, well, it, it basically turns it into like a proxy for some sort of mental health issue in terms of like addictions, right? Like we use this, this language that's encoded as addiction for a reason that people just will put on Netflix and Netflix is designed, or at least its settings are designed to auto run. Mm -hmm. You get like 15 seconds to make a decision. They will occasionally after three or four episodes be like, Hey, you still there? Are you still watching? Please click yes. Kind of deal. Um, but you end up just sitting there and blasting through this stuff. And whereas maybe sitting down to watch one episode because, you know, you want to relax, suddenly it is three, four, five hours later. You haven't done anything else but watched it. And you really didn't make a lot of conscious decisions or intentional decisions to keep doing it. And suddenly, yeah. suddenly your time is just gone. And it's almost like you're dissociating. You just don't realize it because normally you'd be limited. Like, I watch one show, it's done. That's it. I have to wait till next week to, to watch it, download it, whatever you do. When you have it on Netflix and you have seven seasons, like I earlier in 2015 binge watched all of The West Wing before they took it off <laughs> Netflix. Like you do. And yeah, it's just boom, suddenly seven seasons. I, I go through it in some short amount of time. It's just, it's, it's such a weird so thing. Really seven? Seven seasons for Jeez. West Wing, yeah. Uh, it was it was over the course of two two terms of presidency. Which yeah, I, yeah, I had it as five in my head. I also been binge watched the West Wing a few mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am a I'm a hateful binge watcher. I I have a very strict rule now that like as of May I think that I do not watch television or movies unsupervised. I need a human being there. Mm-hmm. To tell me when to stop, mm-hmm. because otherwise I will watch all of the television. I went through, I think it was season two of Agents of Shield in a day and a half. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I forced myself to go to bed at six o'clock in the morning. I had been watching them, you know, for about eight or ten hours at that point. And I got up three hours later. I was like, "Okay, I slept. Now I can watch more television." Like I, I have a, I have a deep problem with it. And it is a challenge for me because it means like now I, I, I miss out on stuff. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I only ever watch TV to the point where I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Like by the time I finished that, se- that you know season two of Agents of Shield, I didn't even like the show anymore. Like I, I parsed all the plots, and like this is this is wasting my time. It's male. It's you know, it's it's white male power fantasy. It's seven shades of bullshit, and I don't like it. I don't like what's going on. I don't like how I feel. But I'm gonna watch the last two episodes, and 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 it's that that kind of decision making is a big problem for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it eats up my time, even when I even when I have that time to just you know mess around. It isn't the way I actually want to spend it. Yeah. Because I don't feel good afterward. I don't feel relaxed. I don't feel, you know, better or refreshed or anything. I just sort of look back at it and go, well, that was a thing that happened. <coughs> now, a lot of people tend to approach binge watching. Like, you can still... They say you can still do constructive things, right? Because, I mean, mm. consumption is largely passive. I say that, too. I lie. Yeah. it's And that's the thing I push back on is... Um, I'm so glad that there was no Netflix, or at least I didn't subscribe to Netflix when I was still a student. Um, And I know people who are students who you throw on Netflix and, yeah, you might get a paper written over some period of time. But think of how protracted that is and how distracting it is and how hard it is to to shift attention from, you know, like one mode of thought to the next. Um, And so it's just, it's, it's something... And I guess we should 
put a caveat on this one because you and I talked about there's a book that was recently released, Cal Newport's Deep Work, and you kind of, you and I kind of debated on it. One thing that I missed as I'm reading, so now that I've read through, I'm 110 pages into it now mm-hmm. since the last time we talked. One of the things that he says in the book that I missed in our discussion that I also want to put here is it's maladaptive, but that's not necessarily saying that we're saying categorically binge watching is wrong. Or yeah, that everybody no. must work this like in Cal Newport's book. He doesn't say like he 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 says that deep work is valuable and is important, but he doesn't say at any point that everybody, regardless of your profession, should work this way. Yeah, he's saying this is one that works for me. I want to share it with you, and if you want to uh, try to apply it to your life, do it. So when we say like binge watching can be negative or maladaptive. We're not saying that every context of binge watching is bad. We're not saying that people who binge watch are bad. And we're not saying that binge watching should be reclassified as morally bad or whatever. But it's just the idea that you and I both experience this, that we will binge watch something and then we just feel dirty about it. It is what? We feel so bad. It is the the visual and auditory equivalent of eating an entire bag of potato chips. Yeah. I can do it, and I certainly have, and I will probably do it again, but uh, I don't often feel well afterward. I'm like, oh, that was really yummy the whole time, and then I'm like, I should eat dinner, like (laughs) real dinner. Something with, with like... Nutrients. (laughs) Nutrients. Yeah. <laughs> Proper nutrients, not just salt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> various kinds of salt. Um, so, yeah. And there's there's one that's kind of related a little bit under the banner of consumption. Um, and this one is um, mindless scrolling. And this one largely applies mostly to um, social media, mm-hmm. I find. Uh, you can do a little bit of mindless scrolling in traditional web-based stuff. But, I mean, with Web 2.0 and blogging and stuff like that, content's a little bit different. It's a little bit more two-way in terms of comments and whatnot. and um, It tends to be shorter, digestible, so it comes out with more frequency. But I'll use uh, Facebook and Twitter as a little bit of an example. And maybe more Facebook is the idea where it, it gets set up as this platform that constantly refreshes with new information. Mm-hmm. And when you use it and scroll through it, you're getting those kind of hits of dopamine just from rediscover or discovering, rediscovering new things, seeing things shared that you highly identify with, yep. seeing things shared that you uh, that seems contrary to everything that you are as a person, and you just find yourself scrolling through the content. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like sometimes you like Instagram is a perfect one of this because um, it's not or at least I don't follow enough people that it's it curates my feed so I, when I hit the end point that is I hit the point of which I last you my last, my, saw, last yeah. my last binge and there's no new content below that unless I start following a new person but chronologically I've, I've caught up with all the new stuff since the last time I checked at Facebook it's a little bit different. Maybe that's just because I have like 600 friends on there. So, I mean, there's always potentially new content to discover, practically speaking. Yeah. Um, but The algorithms are a little different for Facebook, too. Yeah. And I, f- I find that I don't do that with Twitter. Yeah. My Twitter is really sort of heavily segmented into lists. Mm-hmm. And I usually give myself about two spins on my mouse wheel before I, I either move on to a different list mm-hmm. or I just... Like, I just... I don't care. Mm-hmm. Twitter is a river. I don't worry about all the water that mm-hmm. that goes by when I'm not dipping my toes in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Facebook, though, I will I will definitely like continue scrolling uh, because I'm looking for that dopamine hit. My 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 signal that I need to get off Facebook is when I start hating everyone I know, mm-hmm. just sort of abstractly. I'm just like, oh, you people all disgust me. I'm like, what does that thought even mean? Yeah. Go do something. But Go have, occupy your brain. <laughs> but yeah, you have these. You have these little uh, bits of mindless scrolling that when you th- sometimes when you sit there and you think about it, it's just like man, like I spend a lot of time doing this that doesn't really have any consequence. Mm-hmm. You, know, you wake up in the morning and sometimes you think I just need to get my brain going. Let me check Facebook and scroll through it. Right? You think it's kind of this benign thing, but you end up sitting there for 10, 15 minutes, not yep. really any more awake. Than you were when you started scrolling through it. Um, there's a joke, so I mean, like I, I, I will admit, 
I've I've dabbled in the Tinders, but a friend of mine has Ooh. a friend of mine has talked about. Bom, bom. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so if if he happens to be watching this, you'll you'll know who you are. But he told me how uh, there's this kind of underlying rule. I don't think he's ever explicitly mentioned it to any woman that he's met on Tinder. But the idea is that if they ever meet face to face, it was because he was on Tinder on the toilet. But that, that's like a perfect example of like mindless scrolling in places you don't think about it. How like how many people use their phones on the toilet? And just sit uh, there and... Sp- how many people admit to using their phones on the toilet is a better question. So I would say I have stopped doing it because I read on the toilet. And I found... <laughs> I, honestly, I found that when I brought devices into the washroom, I stopped reading as much. So I now have a no-tech rule <laughs> when I'm on the toilet. What are you going to do? Just got to get some reading done. Yeah, totally. See you in an hour. If I'm going to be here for any amount of time, I can get a page or two out before I'm done. <laughs> so... So, I don't know you, you, you audience you're probably laughing and shaking your head at me I, I have never been a bathroom reader so I, yeah, I, I, never, I, I never understood that yeah I, I'm busy <laughs> I have things to do I, I got a bad habit I have young affairs age. to manage I mean uh, I started off reading with like reading shampoo bottles out of the cupboard and I eventually started bringing Calvin and Hobbes anthologies in so that was my my introduction at like no, I don't even use my phone. I have affairs yeah. to manage. Yeah, eight or nine years old, I'm bringing Calvin and Hobbes into the toilet. But, um, but I mean, like, yeah. So bringing it back to not my pooping habits, but everybody's pooping habits. <laughs> like, think of how many people use their phone on the toilet and just sit there mindless scrolling. And again, like, you're not really doing anything. You're doing like, literally doing shit all. But you are scrolling through, right? And so these little opportunities you are on the bus. You're scrolling through and whatnot. There's I don't. A- I don't think you're fully taking seriously my favorite part of the day. What doing shit all? Sure, fair <laughs> enough. We, we can we can discuss that later on. Um, but yeah, just think about like scrolling seems like such a such a great thing because it allows you to keep in contact with people. It gives you more exposure to ideas. Whether or not you want to talk about like the echo chamber of like you're only being exposed to ideas that fit within your networks, mm-hmm. that's that's an, another uh, topic altogether. I've recently scaled back my use of of Facebook. Um, I took face the app off my phone, so I find that I'm actually quite disconnected from current events because that was uh, a primary medium that I would get a lot of information from. But mm-hmm. you, so you tend to think of these social networks as highly positive things. And you know what? You, we talked about this in a previous podcast. There are incredibly positive things that have come out of social networks, like life-saving things, yeah. where people's lives have been changed for the better on social media. And so we, we tend to think about it in this way. And then there's these doom names, uh, doomsday name naysayers. There we go. That's what there I was looking for. Naysayers. You got there. You got there. Or over there, like, yeah, there's a, a kind of a, a ludite twinge to what they're saying about demonizing it. But when you think about it, though, like, there's also, there is a legitimate, like, time sink side to it mm-hmm. of sitting there. And for all the good that it's doing, you're not actually doing anything and if the at the most you're doing is engaging in I'm pushing the like button Ryan yeah I'm retweeting things there we go my thumbs uh, there we go boom from so. people who are wittier than me <sighs> yeah and that does what it gives them a dopamine hit I suppose mm-hmm when I mean, you think of how many times you get a notification on your phone uh, that uh, that was so that was a uh, um here's a perfect example of it one of the reasons why I took Facebook off my phone is I realized at work I block Facebook during the day on my computer. I use um, Secure? Secure Time? I don't know. I'll, I'll, I don't know. If I remember, I'll, I'll put the name of it in the show notes. But it essentially allows you as a Chrome extension to designate websites that you blacklist during certain hours of the day. So from 10 o'clock a.m. until 4 o'clock p.m., uh, I have got Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and a few other websites that get blocked. Uh, so if I try to navigate there, it'll block me. If I want to access those sites, I have to go in through incognito mode, basically. Do you ever navigate there unconsciously? Well, I, so here's what one of the reasons why I started doing this and why I took Facebook off my phone is phone vibrates, boom, I look over, I have a, I have a notification, I go to Facebook. I have to check it out. I have a notification. Somebody, somebody uh, liked something. So I have a new friend or whatever. So you, you, kind of without even really thinking, like you just, you could just dismiss it, or it's like, okay, I'm gonna go check it out. And you navigate to there. So I started off by blocking it on my computer at work because I didn't think it would be super appropriate for me to waste all that time. But then I also found that even though it was blocked on my computer, I would still get notifications on my phone, and mm-hmm. I still had the application that had uh, access to it. 
new notification, click, let's go check it out. And I found that I was doing a lot of that kind of transitioning my thinking away from things that I should be focusing my attention on over onto these things that, yeah, I'm supporting my friends, yeah, I'm talking to my friends, I'm being engaged, I'm being active with people, but it's not really something at that particular moment that I need to distract myself with, and then I end up distracting myself far longer than I need to, because, oh, well, notifications done, okay, let's just scroll through the feed a little bit. And so yeah. there's that maladaptive side to that technology that, like I said, it's not bad all the time, and it's not without its benefits, but you know, you, when, once you kind of catch yourself this doing this mindless scrolling, it's like, oh, man, I feel feel bad like i just feel feel mm. like i've wasted an opportunity okay so so that when we talked about consumption mm-hmm. uh, the other one was creation yeah and you actually proposed a wasteful act of creation in the icebreaker your icebreaker answer mm-hmm. arguably is a thing that at the very least you regard mm-hmm. as wasted time mm-hmm um, playing with electronics, learning that. But it is an act of creation. It's an mm-hmm. act of making things. Yeah, I think in my case, it would be tied to just things that don't directly relate to the obligations that I currently have. Mm-hmm. And, I, and that's, that's why... Do you worry that you just don't, get any, you don't give yourself any downtime? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I got the Fitbit uh, at the tail end of 2015, and I've discovered... I knew I didn't sleep a lot... But I thought I was only just barely missing seven to eight hours, but it tracks me per week. I'm sleeping on average about five and a half hours a night. Oh. So I know in there there's a lot of time that I'm just devoting to absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. YouTube. YouTube, you are the bane of my existence. I will spend (laughs) three and four hours a night. Tell us again how in this YouTube video you are decrying. Well, they could be listening to us on iTunes or or anywhere else. I was about to say Stitcher, but I don't think we're on Stitcher. We're not on Stitcher. Maybe that'll be a 2016 goal. Um, So, but yeah, I do recognize the irony of a YouTube video of me talking about how YouTube is the bane of my existence. But um, I just, I just find that. I do have a lot of obligations, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, about being busy and whatnot. Um, But I also do find that uh, on a whim, I'll take on additional projects to make stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to learn a little bit about electronics, and I was telling you about a project. I want to do one of those magic mirror electronics things. And if I ever make it, we'll talk about it, and I'll post some uh, pictures of it or whatever, because it seems like a fun little intro how to make an electronics thing project mm-hmm. but um, that's in from my point of view my creation tends to be maladaptive when it's adding things to a pile without actually addressing or solving any of my additional obligations um, but say say Livia. I mean it's it's such a, a small thing for me uh, but I mean you were in the show notes or when we were making the show notes you were talking about a much more interesting <laughs> conception of this problem <laughs> a much much nerdier conception well it's nerdy um, but it, my 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 concern is is telling stories in the wrong place and it was a thing that I noticed I've been doing recently uh, I play a lot of Skyrim a lot I think I'm at about eight or nine hundred hours and I've only been playing for like a year or two? Oh, they're going to say like a week. No, no, no. There aren't, <laughs> <laughs> there aren't that many hours in a week. Out there, Jim? I, I found it. I found, I found the time. <laughs> I found the singularity. I go back. <laughs> Marty! But, uh, oh dear. No, and, and, but, but, and, it, and it's, and it went from like playing the game normally to playing the game with mods. And I've talked about that a little bit to playing the game. Where I, I I tell a st- I have to tell a story in sandbox games, otherwise I just get lost and mm-hmm. I don't know what to do and I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't have any sort of way to focus on. If you have a game that gives me a to do list, God, I'm such a sucker for it. <laughs> but do you always do optional quests? Like every optional quest? Not every, not all of them, but a lot of them. Yeah. I, like I'll go through phases where I'm like, I'm going to clean up my quest log. Mm-hmm. I have to go and murder some faces, mm-hmm. but. Uh, no, and and I I gotten to the point where I was using the the in game character, um, creation to, because uh, there's a console command for it to edit my character to make them reflect my story. Mm-hmm. So I changed their their 
face paint to their scars or you know their age or their hair and things like that. Like like Skyrim dress up is a very important part of my Skyrim experience. And then I realized that I could reimagine my character entirely as a different character and continue on with them. So I started reimagining them. I am I am sufficiently good at Skyrim that it does not matter mm-hmm. what my like what my character's skills are. I can succeed in pretty much any archetype at this point. Mm-hmm. Um and I know I understand what resources I need to have to do that. But so I, I re I reimagined my character not just into one, another character, but nine other characters. Each of whom had their own story and their own residence, and I found ways to I have a spreadsheet. And I found ways to like make them relate to each other and 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 tell all these stories with them. And there was my Skyrim multiplicity. So I have since designed three additional multiplicities, each with different sort of background themes and different stories and things like that. And it was on my fourth. Um where I went. Oh, it's been a while since I worked on D&D stuff. I run two Dungeons & Dragons games. I write for Mad Art Lab. I make videos, ostensibly, not just with Huck, but on my own. Mm-hmm. I write music. I occasionally attempt to compete in poetry slams. Um, and none of these things were things that I was doing, so I was sort of expending all my creative energy on Skyrim and and also all of my time because I can't just tell these stories in these spreadsheets I want I create these setups so that I can act them in Skyrim so that I can I can journey through that world as a person and inhabit them and make their decisions mm-hmm. and it was it was a very very deep conception of, of, of that notion. I, I said it when we were doing the, the show notes, and that was about a week ago mm-hmm. when we first bandied this around, and I'm telling stories in the wrong places. And since then, every time I go to do that, I'm like, am I telling stories in the right places right now? And I'm like, no, I've got D&D stuff I need to do. I've got um, articles to finish for Mad Art Lab. I've got videos to edit. And the result is, I'm not playing as much Skyrim, and I'm getting vastly more done. It's kind of funny how the, it's kind of like a philosophical re- reflection, and it's actually translated into something useful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is, it, it's a case of, where do I, what is more important to me? Where do I want to tell stories? And the answer is, is, is without question, I always want to tell stories in spaces where I can share them. Mm-hmm. And it is that is one of the things that makes Skyrim fun and, and sort of cathartic is I can tell stories there and I don't have to share them and you know no no one is privy to what goes on in my Skyrim game unless I talk about it I don't have an obligation to share them because mm-hmm. um, sometimes it is hard mm-hmm. and it is hard to continually sort of create that much new content for people mm-hmm. but it is fun and I enjoy it but I forget that I enjoy it can I make one suggestion if you continue to do your multiplicity? Can you like. Please don't ask me to blog about my multiplicity. No. It's really fucking nerdy. No, this, this, one, would be, <laughs> this, this one would be a little bit harsher. Oh. Um, you should challenge yourself that anytime your character dies, their story ends and you don't, you don't go back. Oh. Oh, honey. Is it, you do, do you do that? I, a, yes. Okay. All my, all my Skyrim runs from, for the past, like, Two or three hundred hours have been permadeath runs. Oh, okay, never mind. But I don't die in Skyrim. Yeah, (laughs) I am very. I I have put eight hundred hours into this game. I'm very good at it. I (laughs) when I play games, I am definitely spray and pray, and I respawn a lot. In some games, are like that. Skyrim, Skyrim. My patience is rewarded. My smithing is excellent. My companions are well armed, and I do not die. Uh, only one group of people die in Skyrim, and those are my enemies. 
All right, well, then never mind. Forget <laughs> that I, in that case, audience, how about you consider that if you ever run a multiplicity, why don't you ensure that? <laughs> if you if run a multiplicity, you might want to sort of support die. group with me. Yeah, if your characters die. That's yeah, per- it. no, permadeath runs are really fun, yeah. and 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 permadeath runs in in multiplicities are sort of really interesting. And what do you what do you do, and how do your other characters mourn them? And like, there's story again. It's 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 there are stories to tell about the character who died. Yeah. Um. Each of my multiplicities has someone who always goes unarmed. <laughs> it was something I got into. I don't know, three or four hundred hours ago. It was just periodically it is fun to play townsfolk. It is it is also, um super dangerous yeah because vampires show up dragons show up better just skip town <laughs> until that's done hope the guards take care of it but uh, it is it is an it is an interesting thing but it, it, it's also and it's fun sometimes but it, it definitely got out of control for a while when I was first doing it mm-hmm and it was detracting from all the other places that I needed to be telling those stories and needed to be doing, um, like, writing posts and creating things. Because I don't like going into a and d game and improvising everything. I can. Yeah. And it's kind of fun in a different way, but it's, it's occasionally good to have some kind of plan. Yeah. And the last topic we had written down was busyness is binging, and just mm-hmm. that notion of... You can be sort of... I mean, all of these are, are, are self-destructive ways of spending time, mm-hmm. really. I mean, it, it, isn't, it isn't that binge-watching, for example, is, is inherently bad. It is that, for me, it is self-destructive. Mm-hmm. It makes me feel bad. Uh, it does not make me feel good after, you know, doing it for 18 hours. Skyrim 2. Two hours, three hours of Skyrim, I'm a very happy man. 18 hours of Skyrim, I start going, oh my god, what am I doing with my life? And that isn't a good feeling. But but there is a there is such a thing as just, fill, you just fill your calendar with things. Mm-hmm. And the result is that uh, you're so busy doing those things that you don't get any downtime. And that, like, that, the busyness itself becomes self-destructive mm-hmm. I try not to use the word busy anymore mm-hmm. uh, when it, people ask me what I've been up to or how I'm how I'm doing I think I mentioned this previously in another podcast but it is just that if I cannot describe to you what I have been doing it is not very interesting mm-hmm. and if I am just being boring I should just tell you that I'm being boring which is what I tell people now I'm like, what did you get up to last week? And I think about it, and I'm like, well, I mostly spent it uh, sitting in uh, a place playing video games, and uh, not really talking. And you know what? I was just, I was super boring last week. Ask mm-hmm. me about a different week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I am in terms of my scheduling. I guess I am busy. Part of it is is I work two jobs, like mm-hmm. full time job, part time job, volunteer experience. And you and I were kind of comparing comparing our, our schedules and our and our obligations and whatnot so i think you did win in that one you are I, you are legitimately more i don't busy know that i win that <laughs> i don't know that that's winning and i don't know what winning means in that context yeah especially because i don't work two jobs i just edit all the podcasts <laughs> you can tell the, the, the lack the jobs are starting to catch up with me and the lack of sleep but um yes uh, my my weekly schedule is fairly locked down in terms of like you know so I work nine to five basically and then work Wednesday Friday Saturday nights at the bar and Mm -hmm. I don't really like to do anything between the end of one job and the start of the other one just for the sake of sanity and but then you know like Mondays are usually meeting up with a few friends or doing the podcasting stuff and Tuesdays usually gym day like Going to the gym. Every day is gym day. Every day is gym day. But Tuesdays I usually go to the gym and do groceries. And, and then Thursdays is one of the few unrestricted days that I have that I sometimes catch up on other work. Um, or I have ethics board meetings scheduled for those days. And yeah. then Saturday and Sunday is I want to catch up on sleep, but I don't want to sleep in because, you know, I don't go to bed till 3, 4 in the morning. And so 
sleeping in until 10 feels terrible, even though I'm only sleeping five or six hours at that point. Yeah, because you're working late at the bar. Yeah, and so so I have these limited hours on weekends where, like this weekend, um, I still hadn't hit the gym. Uh, I had to take the car in to get um, repaired and had to go to the library to do some homework. And today I had to help move a fridge or a fridge, or help move a stove. You don't even know what you moved. Yeah, that's the thing. It's so, <laughs> I mean... In some sense, I am binging on busyness. Um, I, too, try not to say I'm busy, but usually it's just, you know, how have you been? Oh, you know, I uh, lots of work kind of deal. Because like, for me, it's, the two jobs takes it, you know, because I'm, yeah. working, I'm working 48 plus hours a week. I think, I think I work, well, it's 35 hours at the one job and then minimum 12 hours at the other job usually. So it's like almost 48 hours a week, um, if not more, depending on the shifts. So that's just work, and that's a spling, um, swing shift. Like uh, I'm splitting the work up in the day. I'm not doing like, you know, twelve hour days unless I'm out of the house the entire time. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. In some in some sense, this feels qualitatively different than if the busy question before I started to engage, where I was just filling out my schedule with a, a, a bunch of to dos. Um, but. Yeah, I think I think this one is just I, I've I schedule the the calendar. It's fairly locked in, and I do what I can with it. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I do with busyness is binging, and I don't know if it's healthy or not. So advise us on your unhealthy habits. But in the meantime, I'm going to send Huck away so he can take a nap. Probably should take a nap. Yeah. Yeah, we don't really have anything insightful to say as this one because we haven't figured it out ourselves. <laughs> but we are fully willing to admit that it's something we're thinking about. Oh, yeah. It's fairly maladaptive to, to be binging in this way, especially on busyness. <laughs> but uh, no, we're going to sign off so I can go sleep. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And as I mentioned, we're signing off. And stay, don't stay busy, just stay awesome. I do want to dig through them all. For like a highlight podcast. Yeah. But given that we have, what, 40 plus hours of them, um, it is not a mission for one man. So basically, Huck and Jim, X a thing, is now going to be... <laughs> Huck and Jim watch all the podcasts. Eventually, it's like, no, oh, we're quitting. This is so bad. Yeah. Why do, why do people keep telling us this is good and encourage us to do this? Mm-hmm.